Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to welcome you all to Trinity's final Food for Thought lecture series for the academic year. This lecture series has been a valued community service tradition of Trinity University for more than 30 years. Tonight's discussion is brought to you by Trinity University Alumni Relations and Development Division in the Office of Special Events as a part of Trinity's commitment to lifelong learning. My name is Andrea Acevedo. I graduated class of 2018 as a communication major. Uh, currently, I am a designer based in Austin, and I have a deep interest in the intersection of art, emerging technologies, and political activism. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce my co-speaker this evening, Trinity Associate Professor Dr. Camille Reyes. She investigates public relations in the co context of activism and social justice movements. I was fortunate enough to take her PR and social movements class while I was a student. Her work has appeared in journals such as Public Relations Inquiry, Journalism History, and Communication, Culture, and Critique. She earned her PhD at Rutgers University School of Communication and Information. At the end of the lecture, we will host a Q&A session, but you can submit your questions at any time during this presentation using the Q&A tab. The questions will be summarized, but we will do our best to field as many as we can. Uh, thank you, and now please welcome Dr. Camille Reyes. Thank you, Andy. I have to say it is such a treat to get to work with Andy again. She was a phenomenal student and I'm just delighted to be here with her this evening. We're gonna be talking about activism, big PR, which I will define, and visual communication. This represents our early work together. We both have older projects that we're sort of um, finding the, the synergy with together and we're excited to share this early work with you. My portion of the presentation is based on a forthcoming article in the journal Media and Communication. And we're gonna dig in first um, with Andy giving some details about what's going on currently at the Mexico-US border. And then we'll move on to talking more in depth about public relations and how this connects. Then Andy will come in with what I think is the heart of the presentation. It's the gut punch, it's why this work matters, at least in my mind. And then as Andy mentioned, we'll have the Q&A at the end. So that's what's on the table for this evening. We wanna start by telling you a little bit about our backgrounds though. I had a long career professionally in marketing and public relations, 13 years before I went to graduate school to do what I'm doing now. I served a variety of clients, uh, including Burgerville, which is a beloved fast food chain in the Pacific Northwest, and Microsoft. And Microsoft will enter into the discussion a little later. But I wanna tell you all a little bit about why this project matters to me at a personal level. I'm the daughter of an immigrant. My father, who is pictured here, came to the United States when he was about 10 years old, fleeing from Cuba when Castro came to power. Um, my late grandfather was a high-ranking military officer under Batista, so clearly we had to go. Um, but I'm not sure I would be here without a very liberal policy that was in place up until the Obama administration known as wet foot, dry foot, which meant if you were Cuban and you put one foot on U.S. soil, and let's say the other foot was in the Gulf of Mexico, you were granted asylum to the United States. Clearly, I have a, a fairly liberal point of view when it comes to immigration based on that background. But as a researcher, it's my responsibility to ask questions in a systematic way and try to be as objective as I can. But I do think it's important to share where we're coming from because we're human and as humans, we all have biases. So. I thought it was important to sort of share that background with you. And now I'd like to ask Andy to do the same. Thank you, Dr. Reyes. Um, similar to Dr. Reyes, my personal background intertwines with my interest in this topic. Um, as most of us in America, my family consists of immigrants. My parents and I are from Mexico City, but even though I was born in Ciudad Mexico and had an early introduction into the US immigration system, I still had a very limited understanding of so much of the immigration process and the systems behind it. Um, in fact, it wasn't until around 2015 when I did some volunteer work with Casa de Raices in San Antonio that I learned more about the tough immigration system that we have. 
throughout my volunteer work, I got to hear firsthand about some of the experiences that asylum seekers are put through on their journey for a better life. My portion of this talk includes a summer project that I worked on with Dr. Aaron Delwich in communication while I was an undergraduate as a part of the Mellon Research Initiative. Professionally, I don't work within a PR role, but I do work in marketing, so I have experience looking at the way that brands tell their stories and carefully craft their messaging. Next slide, please. So in the very debates, discussions, and news blasts that we are exposed to regarding immigration detention centers, there is a huge discrepancy in the messaging between what comes from PR agencies and managing facilities versus the firsthand accounts and media coverage that we see. Um, so to discuss some of these discrepancies, on the far left, you see a promotional image of the Montgomery Processing Center in Conroe, Texas. Um, you can find this image if you go to the GEO Group's website. The GEO Group is a privately owned for-profit prison corporation that manages correctional facilities across the United States. So this includes jails and prisons as well as immigration detention centers. In the middle, you see the also privately run Eloy Detention Center in Arizona. Um, I acquired these images from a 2016 court case, uh, Doe versus Johnson. The case included testimonies from an inspector that the facility of the facility that stated that the facility was dissatisfactory in providing just basic sanitary conditions and, and basic human dignity. It was reported by the inspector that many detainees were denied showers unless they showed explicit evidence of scabies. Keep in mind that many people come from different places. Some have been on very long journeys, have been traveling in the desert and to not be able to shower after many days is, is very inhumane. In addition to that, the inspector found that the overcrowding was directly impacting hygiene, toilets were not being maintained, they were backed up, and toilet paper was not being frequently refilled. Uh, temperatures are also notoriously set to 58 degrees, which have earned them the name of yeleras, which in English means ice boxes. So um, if you look back at the middle image, imagine sleeping in that cell with no, with a no real bed and blankets. Um, and this is just a short list of the issues that was brought forward by the inspector. Uh, and lastly, on the far right, you see one of the many tragedies that befalls people who don't make it. This is an image of the facility at Texas State University where unidentified migrant bodies are left to decompose. The university catalogs their remains as well as belongings that they had with them when they died in hopes of connecting them with their families back home. This image is from an investigative journalism piece by the New York Times about a single county, uh, Brooks County here in Texas, that had over 500 recovered bodies between 2009 and 2017. But the actual number of uh, the deceased is not known, and this is only a fraction of the death toll. Um, and yet the death, death was a risk that people coming here were very well aware of, and yet they chose to come anyway. Uh, that desperation is something that I frequently see left out of like daily stories and news regarding detention centers and immigration. So again, how do we get from this picturesque recreational center on the left um, to the middle image from a surveillance camera directly in a uh, detention center? Um, and why do we see this discrepancy? Uh, so now to give you a, some statistics and a general overview of where we are this year, uh, Dr. Yes, thank you. Um, March gathered significant news coverage due to the number of people that were moving throughout the southern border. In a report by the Wall Street Journal, it was determined that border agents arrested around 170,000 migrants crossing the southern border uh, just in the month of March. Uh, so again, this isn't everybody who is going into immigration detention centers, but it does show the numbers of people that are coming through the southern border. And NPR reported that from those migrants, 8,900 were unaccompanied minors. And uh, they are reportedly citizens of, uh, mainly citizens of Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, uh, citing gang violence, hunger, poverty, and corruption. And to discuss some of the most recent numbers in immigration, I looked at reports directly from uh, the Immigrations and Customs Enforcement website. Uh, they have statistics that reported that they had around 18,434 people in detention um, as of May, 2021. And there have been approximately 214 deaths in ICE custody since 2004. Um, a little current events, which also coincides with the release of this image that you see on the right, uh, there have been around 6,800 confirmed cases and eight reported deaths. 
Um, as you can see on this image, there is not really a way for people to social distance. Um, so those are a lot of numbers and we are frequently presented with very overwhelming statistics, but we ask that you see those statistics and also attach lives and families and faces behind them throughout the course of our presentation. And with that, I will pass it back to you, Dr. Reyes. Thank you. So what does public relations have to do with any of this? Um, big PR is not only public relations, but advertising, branding, marketing, lobbying, anything that we might classify as the practice of influence or persuasion. And it's big business, 68.7 billion for last year alone. Uh, most of that revenue is coming from four conglomerates known as the big four, publicists, Omnicom, WPP, and IPG. Here you see WPP and their subsidiaries, lots of iconic names in advertising, including Gray, J. Walter Thompson, Young and Rubicam, and importantly for our discussion today, Ogilvy. David Ogilvy is known as one of the fathers of American advertising. It's an iconic agency that has helped lots of clients through the years, including some problematic ones like Coca-Cola and British Petroleum. Current clients include Samsung, Pizza Hut, Cadbury. So they are well known to put it mildly within the industry. One of their current clients, however, is extremely problematic as we academics like to say, that is US Customs and Border Protection. And in the summer of 2019, Ogilvy found itself in hot water in relation to their client, CBP. They were charged to do advertising work for them, which we will unpack in a moment. But in 2019, Raices, which is a fabulous local nonprofit here in San Antonio that provides legal and education services to migrants, Raices misattributed a video that showed the terrible conditions at the border, much like Andy was just showing us. They misattributed that video to Ogilvy. Ogilvy, in fact, had not done it, but it put Ogilvy in the spotlight, including with their own employees. So Ogilvy didn't make any public statements, but they did realize that they had a problem on their hands and that there were a lot of what I call activist employees who were very upset and wanted Ogilvy to resign the CBP account. Consequently, CEO John Seifert met with his employees on July 9th of 2019, and it didn't go well. One of the employees leaked the transcript of that meeting to BuzzFeed. And I have to say, as a researcher, I'm glad they did because it's delicious from that perspective. It's 35 pages of an inside look of how a global agency culture functions. And having worked for a global agency myself, a lot of it was very familiar, but it was, again, such a rare opportunity to see behind the curtain. Ogilvy decides not to resign as of this, this presentation, they still haven't resigned the account. Raices steps in again in August to try to keep the pressure up on them by penning an open letter uh, on Twitter to Ogilvy president, Lauren Crampsey. Racist continues the fight and continues to try to support those um, internal activist employees. But again, as of now, they have not resigned the account. And I wanna contrast that briefly with another agency, Edelman, that found itself in similar hot water about a similar issue in the summer of 2019. Edelman is the largest independent PR agency in the world. Um, and that's important because I think it has everything to do with why there was a different result in the Edelman case. Now we don't have a transcript to go to, but Edelman employees were very upset that the agency was about to undertake work for Geo Group, the very same private prison operator that Andy had mentioned earlier. Edelman's employees were successful in persuading management to not do that work for Geo Group. And again, I think it has everything to do with the independence. Edelman, unlike Ogilvy, does not have to answer to a giant parent company. WPP employs 100,000 people across the globe. Uh, Edelman is probably 10 times smaller than that. Um, so, and the pressures are very different. You don't have the shareholders that you do at a giant conglomerate to, to satisfy. 
So very different sort of structures here, which I think contribute to the different results in these sort of similar cases. Let's talk a little bit about that client, that problematic client for Ogilvy, US Customs and Border Protection. To put it mildly, public opinion is against them. This quote that you see here, people, people actively hate us from a CBP officer, that was in an amazing New York Times profile about what the Border Patrol officers go through and how they are perceived and how they are treated. Um, Regardless of your politics, it's not an easy job. And from the government's perspective, they need many, many more officers at the border. In fiscal year 19, they captured more migrants than they had in 12 years. So you can see Ogilvy has a big uh, charge in front of it, right? They need to rehabilitate somehow the image of CBP and recruit more people um, to this organization. And that brings me to some of their work. I'm gonna play this ad for you in a moment that Ogilvy made to try to attract uh, candidates to CVP. I'm not gonna say much about it because I'd like for you to watch it with fresh eyes, but I will ask you to jot down what, how you might characterize this ad to someone who doesn't have the benefit of seeing it. How would you describe it to them? And I'm gonna ask you to put some of those thoughts in the chat as soon as we're finished watching it. There's freedom in a place where every day is different. Here, there is no script to follow, just your gut. Here, you combine your strengths and work together to protect something bigger than yourself. Accomplish the mission and save lives, day and night, by making the right decisions in the blink of an eye. This isn't just a job, it's a calling, because we're protecting more than a line on a map, but a way of life. Ours. This is no ordinary job. This is the border. Are you ready to protect? Apply now. Okay, I am now looking at the chat. I'll go back to full screen in a moment, but I'm looking at the chat, hoping to hear some responses or see some responses about how you might describe the ad you just watched to someone who couldn't see it. Militaristic. Other ways you might describe it, car ad for uniforms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Motivational. Intimidating music, it's a calling equals true believers. Protection, us versus them. I think these are all uh, really, and you can keep them coming and I'll, I'll do my best to, to field them, but I think these are all very apt descriptions um, for what you're seeing, um, machismo. Um, there's, they're definitely, I think, and hopefully you agree, some of you do, trying to get across this image of um, the job being about protection. protection. Um, and there's almost a sense of, um, hunting going on too, right? With, with the, the tracking um, and the ATVs and that sort of thing. Um, the music in particular, 
yes, protection is definitely in the agency name. That is their job, right? I'm not trying to um, minimize their job or what they do. Um, the music gets me in terms of what they're trying to do from an advertising perspective. It reminds me of almost like a spaghetti Western, you know, Clint Eastwood's gonna make a cameo next, right? That's what they're going for, right? They want that sort of macho image to come through and to get, um, as one panel, uh, person said, attendee said, the, the uh, true believers to come on board, to join them in this fight to protect what's ours. So if we can all agree, yeah, super intense music. If we can all agree that that was sort of the goal of the ad, I'd like you all to think about that now that I tell you that Ogilvy claims the ad is meant to attract diverse candidates to CVP. That's what they say, right? That that was their charge, that they're supposed to make the CVP uh, better by attracting diverse candidates. I don't think it accomplishes that, but I'd like you all to think about that. Uh, and, and perhaps in the Q&A, we can get more into that. But I want to move forward for now. Uh, let's see. We have to stop the share for a moment. I'm sorry. Okay, back to full screen. Sorry about that. I want to give a little bit of the political context that Ogilvy found itself in in the summer of 2019. Of course, it starts much earlier, that context, going at least back to Obama. Obama was known as the deporter in chief because he had deported more migrants than any other contemporary US president prior to Trump, including George W. Bush. On the other side of the ledger, Obama created a program known as Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA which was meant to give a clearer path, an easier path to citizenship for children who were brought here with their parents without documentation. One of the first actions that Trump takes as president is to reverse DACA. And he says at the time that DACA is illegal and his hands are tied, there's nothing he can do. And you can kind of hear, I hope, the disbelief in my voice, because if you'll recall, in 2016, the Republicans controlled both houses of Congress. So they could have made DACA law if that had been their intent. It was not. In fact, the Trump administration, along with then Attorney General Jeff Sessions, instituted what was known as zero tolerance policy, which effectively ended asylum to the United States. I can't think of much more uh, less American than that. You know, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Where is that? It wasn't there. In fact, women fleeing domestic violence were not allowed to seek asylum under zero tolerance policy. So it was an extremely um, harsh policy, it marked a big departure. And a judge uh, knocked it down, said that, you know, it wasn't legal. In its place, the Trump administration created something known as Remain in Mexico, which was arguably worse and tried to push the um, problem south of the border. I think that's enough context to help us unpack the Ogilvy case together. Of course, we could do a whole presentation on, on this piece alone. But looking at the Ogilvy case, I wanna sum up management's position and remember, I worked in, 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 you know, for a global agency, so I'm somewhat sympathetic. Management said that the CBP account is far too valuable for them to resign. That's their position. The activist position, and this includes both the internal employee activists and um, organizations like AISIS, the activist position is that, look, CBP is committing human rights violations at the border. Ogilvy should have no part in that. It's a lot more complicated than that which I hope to explore with you now. We're gonna look at this through social issues management, which is a theory from public relations by Coombs and Holiday. It's a part of crisis communication and it looks at communication mechanisms as they define them, definition, legitimacy, and awareness. Definition refers to the terms of the debate. How are you gonna frame it? Crucial work. Legitimacy is related to definition, 
However, it's broader. So this includes things like what gives you the right or the standing to speak on this particular social issue? Um, and what's your credibility on the matter? Awareness, I like to tell my students in my public relations courses that awareness is more art than science. Whether you're trying to put the spotlight on something that will help you solve a general business problem or whether you're dealing with a crisis, building awareness is an extremely challenging job. I wanna dig into that leaked transcript that I was so excited about. I'm gonna show you some quotes on the next few slides and discuss them. What I'm mostly hearing is that we're willing to work with companies that are allowing children to die and that are running concentration camps. In response, Seifert says that car companies allow people to die every single year. So we see the tension here, right? We have on one end, uh, this employee um, mincing no words about their thoughts on what's going on, what was going on at the Mexico US border. And then we have Seifert arguably introducing here a false equivalency to try to um, navigate this very challenging meeting. But in the main, we have tried to find and see the good side in most clients and work with them to mitigate things that over time might be deemed negative. I have to say this quote is super familiar to me because I've uttered similar words. When I was doing work for Microsoft, I would engage in a fair amount of what I would call moral relativism. Uh, Microsoft is a convicted monopolist. There are not too many uh, American companies that can claim that dubious distinction. And yet when I was doing that work, and I admire a lot of their work, I would say things like, well, it's only software, as if software were always harmless. And then I would say things like, well, we are creating customer-centric messages, unlike the anti-competitive messages of the past, right? So I would engage in that sort of talk um, because it is, you know, challenging work. You always have to put your client in the spotlight, no matter what it is they're doing. It's the next quote though, that frankly begins to worry me. The work we were doing for CBP is advancing the good of what that organization can and should be doing by getting the most diverse people with the right set of skills, serving the needs of that organization. I'd like you all to think back now to that ad that you watched. Was it really targeting diverse people, people from minority or underrepresented marginalized groups? As a former PR um, and marketing practitioner, I would say no, definitely not. Um, I would say that this quote is disingenuous at best and it tries to set up Ogilvy as some sort of savior for their client. We'll talk more about that. I've worked here for nine years and I've never not been proud until Monday to come to work. You can almost hear the depression, the desperation in the voice of this employee. I don't believe it's responsible to ask or expect the company to make a choice at an individual level when we're trying to weigh a whole set of factors for the collective good of the company at large. Here we have Seifert almost scolding his employees. How dare they bring in individual personal views to the office. I can tell you with all the work I do in targeting and demographics that that's not gonna to appeal to Gen Z, that's for sure. If someone thinks that I'm not upholding the brand, they should shoot me. I mean that with all seriousness. This quote is also familiar to me. There's a habit at these global agencies to drink the Kool-Aid big time. And you can see Seifert's got a big old cup, but both sides, meaning management and these activist employees are very um, quick to talk about the brand without being specific. And we'll get more into that. Looking through the social issues management lens, we can see that management is trying to deploy diversity in the way that you know, we've already described. But they're doing it another way too that I haven't talked about. Seifert in his opening remarks says that his wife is Mexican and therefore his children are Mexican American. And he does this in a way that reminds me of when people are perhaps behaving in a racist way, 
they say, oh, well, I have a black friend, right? Doesn't exactly excuse the behavior, right? So he's trying to do that arguably here, but maybe a more charitable reading, to be fair to Seifert, is that he wants to establish common ground with these activist employees and show that, look, I care about this issue too. It's personal to me too. Also, it should be noted that Seifert, being an image maker, is very aware of what's going on with public opinion. And he knows that most Americans are going to think that people coming from the border are almost exclusively Mexican. That is false. But with the rhetoric that we saw from Trump before his um, presidency attacking Mexicans, it's not really surprising that that thought is out there. Um, he also knows that, again, this is in the American imagination, who these immigrants are. If you're brown and crossing the southern border, you're Mexican. We know that's false. In fact, in the summer of 2019, the numbers showed that the uh, migration from Mexican nationals was at almost historic lows. And as Andy said earlier, most of these people are coming from um, countries that are under enormous socio-political uh, turmoil, not Mexico. But Seifert knows, again, the way public opinion works. He's also trying to regulate public and private space here. In fact, elsewhere in the transcript, it becomes clear that the only acceptable form of protest for him is the voting booth, period. Politics has no place in the workplace. And that's fine, but it's a problem when you've got a percentage of your workforce that doesn't agree. Now, both sides invoke the brand. Neither do a very good job, does a very good job of defining what those values are. If you were to go to any website for any of these global agencies, you'll see a list of absurdly similar corporate values, um, but no one brings up any of those specific values. And I'll talk about that later as sort of a missed opportunity from an activist perspective. Looking at legitimacy, the question of should the agency trust the client is never asked. In my experience, it's not asked anywhere. It's a given that you're just gonna do what the client wants uh, within reason. And I, argue that this question should be asked. Should the agency trust the client? Of course, the client must trust the agency. You're an agent after all, but the reverse should also be asked. And in terms of internal versus external activists, it's very tricky to um, give what they used to call upward feedback at the agency I worked for. It's not easy. There's a lot of risk involved. In fact, Seifert threatens the jobs of at least two employees during that meeting. And so, and also immigration is not what they do, right? They're image makers. They're not um, steeped in the ins and outs of immigration policy in this country, whereas external groups like Raices are. That's their reason for being. And so they have a lot more credibility to speak in this space. When it comes to the financial stakes, I've mentioned that management maintains that they cannot resign the account without uh, suffering a lot of damage. But I wanna dig into that with you because I think it's important to consider. So in this graph, I'm trying to give you the micro view and the macro view when it comes to the finances around the customs and border patrol work, border protection work. You see at the top of the pyramid that the minimum obligated federal funds is $40.7 million. It could go all the way up to 52.5, depending on the length of the contract and the work performed. When you go down the pyramid, it puts that number in, in greater context. Ogilvy has earned $425.5 million in federal contracts since 2001. Okay, that seems like a bigger number, but when you go down further on the pyramid, you'll see that Ogilvy generated $308 million in fiscal year 2020 alone. So that's kind of small potatoes for them. And it makes you question, well, is this really valuable? But it's more complicated than that, and I'll get to it. But even $308 million is frankly small potatoes when you look at the revenue generated by the parent company in the same fiscal year, $16 billion. 
this means, I think, that the Ogilvy management is under enormous pressure to generate value for the parent company. And Seifert gives even more insight. And I think it's sympathetic as to the value of this account. He says in the transcript that 80% of the DC office of Ogilvy is built upon the CBP work. So if you took that away, if they resigned overnight, if you took that away, effectively the DC office of Ogilvy would cease to exist and you'd have to question if they'd be able to garner any public affairs work going forward if they were to resign that account. So it's complicated, um, but I wanted to, you all to have a, a deeper picture of that. Awareness, this is the, the, the part that I said is more art than science and I'm certainly not gonna solve it here, but I wanna say that social change takes time. All activists know this. And one media cycle is insufficient for creating that change. Raises knows that, Raises tweeted as much. You have to keep the pressure on uh, from an activist perspective if you want to try to create that change. And that leads me to some important takeaways. I think this is clearly a case of profit over people to quote Chomsky. And if you're an activist and you wanna create social change, especially from within, you've got to make it unprofitable to oppress people. And until you do that, you're probably not gonna see very much change, at least at that conglomerate level. Activists also need to connect to larger social justice narratives. This is a finding from Chelsea Woods, a, a scholar at Virginia Tech. She found that when activist groups were able to connect their micro issues to those larger narratives, they had much more success. And going back to the social issues management model, when you can use those communication mechanisms to increase accountability, you're also likely to have more success from an activist perspective. In this case, I think if the employees had perhaps been specific about the values that they felt were being violated by the CVP work, they might have gained more traction. Stepping back and looking at PR, marketing, branding, et cetera, from a higher level, I love this quote from a critical cultural scholar of PR in London named Lee Edwards. She says, paying attention to the promotional culture in which public relations thrives prompts ethical questions about the kind of world that we want to live in and public relations role in constructing or obstructing it. I love this quote, not only for practitioners, but for scholars and for consumers, which I'll get to. From the practitioner perspective, it's a very difficult position. As an image maker, it is your job to put your client in the best possible light. What do you do when that client is arguably committing human rights violations? It's not an easy situation. From the consumer standpoint, I know many of us might feel like, well, what can we do? You know, we don't have anything to do with this. What can we do? And I think that at a very basic level, understanding media will help. Of course, I'm gonna say that, right? I'm a media studies scholar, uh, but I think it's true because if we're able to understand the way our media system works and as activists pull those levers, you're much more likely to have success. I can't think of a single social movement that has had success without some sort of media power behind it. And media literacy is difficult. It's a full-time job. I teach mass media in addition to public relations courses at Trinity. And I have to tell you, it's humbling trying to keep up with everything going on in our mass media system. And we've also seen enormous changes. Mass media have become much more atomized, making it very difficult to reach masses. So what do you do as a concerned citizen, as a concerned consumer? I think in addition to understanding and improving our media literacy, you've got to take action. And I'm inspired, quite frankly, by the work that Andy has done and is doing in, in the realm of visual communication. I think it's much more emotional and packs a really big punch. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Andy. All right, can you see my screen all right? 
All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Reyes. That question of how we use like visual communication to create change is a huge consideration and a driver for me in the works that I have built and am continuing to build, as well as your idea that uh, building awareness is more art than science. As a designer, that really speaks to me. Uh, to set the stage for my project today, I included uh, I, I included uh, in this slide a photo of an installation by the campaign No Kids in Cages. Uh, the campaign installed 20 cages around the city of New York for train detained children. They used child-sized dolls and covered them with the standard Mylar blanket um, that, you, that is usually provided to detainees. Interestingly, I might add that an advertising agency called Badger and Winter started the hashtag No Kids in Cages to support racists. So this is the other side of PR and marketing directly working against detention centers. The attention that this installation was able to gather while having people confront this hard issue outside of a news environment is it, in a face-to-face -face encounter is something that I wanted to replicate. Uh, but I also wanted to utilize technology and storytelling to do so. On the left, here is a quick example um, of an interactive story that the New York Times built using 3D models. It just kind of helps tell their story. I originally had a different example, but this just came out yesterday. So the technology is alive and well and being used to um, just kind of aid in, to fill in the gaps where text and images just don't. Uh, so I wanted to utilize this concept and build on it uh, and to present documentation and news surrounding detention centers. Uh, I, like many other people in 2016, had a very difficult time with the rhetoric that surrounded immigration, especially during Trump's rise to presidency. I also noticed in some of my peers that there was a general lack of knowledge about the subject. Uh, it is easy for people to see statistics and to glaze over personal experiences of the migrants that we're reading about. So I wanted to find a way that would grab people's attention similar to the New York Times and the No Kids in Cages campaign and to present information in a way that felt more personal and immersive as well as educational. At the time, virtual reality was being held up as this ultimate empathy machine. So we moved forward with exploring that and using VR as a medium to present this exhibition. Uh, VR would ideally present people with a face with face to face scenarios similar to the example that we see with the no kids in cages campaign. Uh, and this is especially relevant since most Americans are so far removed from immigration detention centers and will likely never see the inside of one. Um, if you're not familiar with VR or virtual reality, the image here shows what that looks like. Um, this is an image that was taken of me uh, inside of the project. Um, your vision is completely obstructed and you are put into this virtual room. So where did we begin? I found existing pictures of detention centers that showed asylum seekers and migrants being held in various holding cells uh, using items in the photos, such as water bottles, um, and then finding specific dimensions of what these beds tend to to be like, I was able to build approximately sized 3D models. Uh, the image on the left is a screen capture from the actual virtual reality exhibition room that was that we created for the Mellon Research Initiative. Um, it is a VR exhibition depicting different rooms that you might encounter in immigration detention centers. Uh, the models were all housed inside of this virtual exhibition hall where you could walk in and out of rooms. And as you would move through the rooms, you would be presented with wall text and information and audio. So picture almost like a virtual museum. Uh, like I mentioned, in addition to the visuals, I, I included audio from letters that uh, I found that were collected from former detainees. Um, these are from the Dilly Detention Center. And so people in the exhibition could learn about the harsh conditions as well as experience just how crowded they felt. So while you have the headset on, you can actually walk up and, and just feel that firsthand experience. And while the first iteration of this project was in a virtual reality environment, since we're not in person, I unfortunately can't show you with the headset, um, but I did create some of the models in a web format and I have linked it in the website below if I can click on it. Um, and you can also visit it, I recommend on a um, desktop device. It's the, this tiny URL, um, tinyurl.com slash VRspin. And so I recreated some of the models in this uh, web format. And here you can see some of the rooms that I built for it. 
Um, they feature annotations as well as related news resources. Um, and you're able to interact with the models, click through links. And if you have a VR headset, actually um, view it in VR. Um, for the purposes of this, I will just go through it like this. Um, and so you're actually able to interact here and go in and just kind of get a feel for the environment. And I made a variety of different models um, just to kind of aid some information that I had. Um, this is this model was to explain the ankle monitors that are frequently put on migrant adults after they have been released. Um, as you can imagine, um, these going around your ankles, it makes it a bit hard to change your clothes or and they have to be charged several times a day. And that information is all seen here. I have a couple of other models here, as well as an explan explanation of the Mylar blankets that I mentioned earlier, um, and just some more information. And you can also, I also included several links so that you can do reading. Um, as Dr. Reyes mentioned, media cycles come in and out. So I wanted this to be a resource where you can go in and, and reference um, other impactful articles that might have been left behind by the algorithm and just by time in general. So this website is serving as the beginnings of this new iteration where I hope to build upon a list of resources where people can also uh, access guides that they might need. Uh, for example, there are forms here and links to forms where you can get help um, on a variety of issues. Here's one uh, with a guide on how to request that you um, get your ankle bracelet removed. Um, so I look, let's see, um, uh, there was so much more work to be done. Uh, looking forward, I see art and design as powerful tools for activists to democratize information and to use new technologies to spread the reach of this knowledge. Uh, this accessibility alongside the breakdown of complicated systems into understandable visuals and graphics serves to not only increase awareness and build understanding, but also break down barriers to get help and to help. Um, other documentation how to's are very outdated and littered with jargon and heavily reliant on text. So visual communication is able to reach vast audiences with the internet and social media tools to organize and demand accountability. Um, speaking of jargon and outdated visuals, um, my next goal is to take this link that I found um, on a resource online and, and recreate it in a way that if you look through the document and it's just, it's very difficult to parse through. Um, so this continued pressure on the systems that we have that are in place um, is, it, it's what leads to change. It can lead to businesses turning away from contracts and to increased oversight. And that is something that I hope to continue to build upon. Um, and to conclude my presentation, I want to look at other tools and examples beyond the 3D models and website that I just went over. There are even more things designers and activists are doing to facilitate the dissemination of information. Um, so I wanna leave y'all with some images here that are some excellent examples of designers both simplifying systems for a lot of different audiences while encouraging action and participation. Uh, so they have resources like what you can do if you are detained or if immigration detention or immigration agents come to your home. Um, there are also resources that artists create that explain the current uh, policies and then what you can do to get involved. Um, that concludes my portion of the presentation. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. We will now open it up for the Q&A session. And if you haven't done so already, please submit your questions using the Q&A tab. There is also a link in the chat and Dr. Reyes and I will answer the questions accordingly. Okay, Dr. Reyes, um, it looks like we, give me one more. Sorry, my dog was uh, being a little noisy. Um, all right. I see a one question here, Dr. Reyes, that says, um, are you able to see the chat? Um, I'm looking at the Q and A, so, but you tell me what you want me to answer here. 
Um, so, together too, it's not just me. Yeah, there. I am seeing that there's a question. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the diversity of staff and what uh, kind of diversity that Ogilvy was trying to attract with the advertisement. Great question. Um, my familiarity, I'll just be upfront. It, it's it's not super familiar, but from reading um, that New York Times profile in particular about the experience of Border Patrol officers, it doesn't sound like they're very diverse. Um, sounds like predominantly white men. Um, and as far as what kind of diversity was Ogilvy trying to attract with the ad, I'm stumped on that one. In fact, um, I don't think that was their goal, right? I, I worked in advertising. I like to sort of reverse engineer creative briefs that come before the final product. And if you asked me to reverse engineer the creative brief on that ad that we watched, diversity would not enter into the picture at all. Um, so I don't think they were trying to attract diverse candidates with that ad. Okay, um, next I see another question that says, does Ogilvy service health and human services? I don't know if they service health and human services specifically. I do know that something like 75% of Ogilvy's federal contracts come from the executive branch. And I'm not familiar enough to know if health and human services falls under the executive branch. And again, I don't know if they specifically um, work with that um, organization. Um, I see an interesting question that says, is there any crossover between border activist work and the larger issue of private jails in general? Um, I definitely think so. Personally, I am not involved in that um, aspect of it, but I could see similar situations like what the website that I built and the models that I built um, kind of working in the same way or bringing awareness and being used uh, as visuals. But um, personally, I, I'm just not involved in it. And I would say that this issue, it's so complex. Um, we obviously have our perspectives, which we shared up front, but it's such a complex issue, immigration is, that it creates unlikely or, or, or sort of surprising uh, bedfellows. Um, when I was looking at the Edelman case, which again, I don't have an, a, enough information to really do a whole presentation on, but I was digging into Geo Group, uh, the private prison operator, and I discovered that there were all sorts of state pension funds that were trying to divest from those types of private prison organizations, which was wreaking havoc in the private prison industry. And so you have these weird sorts of connections um, circulating around immigration, you know, um, mm -hmm. in, in, in an interesting way. Yeah. Um, I see a question, are editorials and social media also a part of the Ogilvy campaigns? Um, that's a great question. From what I found, the bulk of the contract was for recruitment advertising specifically. Now, Ogilvy, it's, Ogilvy is a complex organization within a complex organization of WPP, but they have Ogilvy, they're all under the Ogilvy group. But within the Ogilvy group, they also have something called Ogilvy Public Relations. And Ogilvy Public Relations doesn't do any work for CBP. I have couched this presentation under the umbrella of presentation of, of public relations because I'm looking at it through a crisis communication lens and crisis communication falls squarely within public relations. But the actual work that Ogilvy is doing is more uh, correctly categorized as advertising purely. Uh, I see one direct question um, behind the inspiration for uh, me making the model work. Um, I can definitely share, I, I don't know if we will be able to share this presentation, but I definitely cover it. And it's a, a lot of different things, both a personal interest in the actual um, subject of it, and then my interest in using art and design uh, and these new emerging technologies to kind of tell a story. I'm gonna ask Andy a question because we talked about this earlier um, and I think it's really interesting. Andy, what would you do differently if you were to start your project over again today? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that 
virtual reality is this, it, it, for a long time, it was being called this like excellent empathy machine. Um, I don't know if that's true yet or if we are at that point because it's such a new technology that so many people are more like lost in the novelty of the actual um, experience. Like they'll, they'll put on the headset and be like, wow, I can't see where I am anymore. And, and the actual story gets lost on it. So I really like the way that in this website, it's you still have this sort of interactive feature and this 3D model that kind of you can have be more personal and you can still see in VR if you have a headset. Um, but it gives you a little more time to reflect on the actual messaging behind it rather than just um, seeing it quickly, putting it on being like, oh, this is cool. And so that's, I, I think that, I think it's on the right path. It was interesting to explore that and, and just kind of see how people react to virtual reality. Any other questions? I'll give it just a little bit longer. Okay, um, I'm not seeing a whole bunch of other questions come in. Um, and it looks like we're getting pretty close to time. Uh, so I, everybody, thank you so much for joining. I hope that you have enjoyed this evening's presentation. Um, for more information on Trinity University's webinars and podcasts, uh, please visit trinity.edu forward slash alumni. And this concludes our final Food for Thought lecture for the 2020-2021 uh, series. To date, the series has seen more than 2,945 registrations representing alumni from 32 states plus Mexico and Canada. Uh, so stay tuned for the fall schedule and thank you everybody for joining us.